All right, Calvary, we're going to continue in a series we started last week entitled Formed. And the premise of this, we said last week and we'll continue to say it each week, is that we are all formed by something or someone. What it is to be human is a learned experience from other humans. What it means to be a man, a woman, young, old, married, single, a child, a brother, a sister, we have learned that from other people. God has put us first and foremost in families to form an idea of what it means to be human. From there, we had friends, and then we had teachers, we have coaches. And they get to a point where like, you choose who you want to follow, who you want to be an influence in your life. So I subscribe to their podcast. I subscribe to their channel. I follow their Instagram because I want to be like them. A disciple is a student, a follower of a teacher or an influencer. So the reality is everybody is a disciple of somebody. The question isn't, are you following someone? The question is, who are you following? And maybe it's many voices. And what we said is as Christians, as, as followers of Jesus Christ, we want Jesus Christ to be our ultimate primary influence of who we are and who we become. We want the fullness of Christ fully formed in us. We want the, the, the spirit of Christ, the, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. His mercy, his generosity, his justice to be formed in us that we would look like him, that we would act like him in all the places that we work, live, and play. And so we are disciples of Jesus Christ. We want him to form his life, death, and resurrection, the power of that, in us. Now, one of the primary instruments of how we are formed is around the area of time. How we use our time forms us. In particular, I want to talk about how we address something the Bible calls Sabbath, a practice of time. Now, when you hear the word Sabbath, there's probably a lot of ideas that come to mind, a lot of influencers you've had to shape this idea of what Sabbath is. And my desire for you is to be fully convinced in your mind what you believe this practice of Sabbath to be. In fact, that's what was in Paul's mind when he was writing to a church with some who said, man, it's absolutely important to practice Sabbath this certain way. And there are others in the church that said, no, man, all days are the same. We don't have to practice Sabbath. And so what Paul writes in Romans 14, 5, is one person esteems one day as better than another, like a holy day, while others esteem all days alike. And this is what he says, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. And so I hope to present to you a biblical view of Sabbath that you could become fully convinced in your mind of how you use time. Because time is a commodity. If I asked you what your most precious, valuable commodity is, some of you might say, well, it's the dollars that I have because of the volume of it. Others might say, it's an heirloom that my grandfather or grandmother gave to me because of its rarity. I would like to suggest that your most valuable asset is time. It doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. It doesn't matter what you do in your life. You have been allotted 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 12 months in a year, and I don't know how many years you're given. You don't get to buy more of it. You don't get to have more of it. It is a fixed commodity, really. And so it becomes the most valuable thing of how do we use it, especially when we're thinking about our formation of who we're becoming is associated to how we use time particularly around this idea of Sabbath, a rhythm of time that's patterned for us as God's people. So the first mention of Sabbath we're going to look at is Exodus chapter 20. This is where it first shows up. In Exodus chapter 20, what we're going to find is that God has brought his people out of Egypt, out of slavery, and he's brought them to this mount before they're going into a land of promise. And there he is giving his ways, his laws, his practices of of forming, shaping a people that would then reflect who God is to the world around them. 
And the Decalogue, Deca meaning 10, is the Ten Commandments that he gives. And here in the Decalogue, we see that the fourth commandment has to do with this institution of Sabbath. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, Moses says that God has written down, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner, immigrant, who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So the first thing that we see in Exodus 20 is shaping, forming a people has to do with time. And it's connected, first and foremost, to the creation story. Now this is important because early church fathers like, like Justin Martyr, he says, well, Noah didn't practice Sabbath. Abraham didn't practice Sabbath. We don't have to practice Sabbath. But here, what's established in a Sabbath rhythm is not in Noah, not in Abraham, but is in the way God created the world. So let's go to Genesis chapter 2, second page of your Bible. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, we've seen that God has created all the things, heaven and earth, and filled them, brought animals in according to their kind, brought species in according to their kind. On the sixth day, he does something radically different. He creates humanity, men and women, male and female, in his likeness. He creates men and women in the imago Dei, the image of God. In the likeness of God, he creates them male and female, blesses them, and then it says he rested. Chapter 2, verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And this is key. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. What you see here is that God, in a, in a work-rest rhythm, God knows when to cease from his creativity. Do you have any idea in your life when you should cease from your creativity? When you should stop creating. Think about this. God has created the heavens and the earth. He's filled with all sorts of things. He's embedded into creation, things that we're going to discover to create life as we know it, but he doesn't create a house. He doesn't create technology, an iPhone, a car, solar panels. He knows when to stop. Do you have any idea when to stop? This is an amazing power, not only to create, but to know when to cease from creating. That's what the seventh day is. It's not that he's exhausted, not that he's tired. It's that he ceases from creating for a moment and he rests. Rest is the ceasing from his work to delight in it, to think about it, to contemplate it. We see this word holy show up for the very first time here. Abraham Herschel, a modern rabbi, points out that the use of the holy right here is the first use of it in the scriptures. Holy means to set something apart from what is common or ordinary. Devote something intentionally to the affections and attention of God. And here, we see that it's used about a day, about how we use time. The first thing that God makes holy is not a temple. It's not a people necessarily. It's not a place in which you have to go to. It is a time, which means that you have access to participate in what God has called holy, no matter where you live. You're not outside of a place in which God first calls holy. He calls time holy. And time becomes a place of life, a place of life that gives life. And so Herschel makes a critique of the Western world and says, okay, the Western world's use of time is so unholy. It's like we we equate time basically to its value of how many dollars will you give me? If I give you an hour... How much money will you give me for that hour? And then I'll evaluate if it's worth my time. In fact, we've created so much leisure time, downtime, that we talk about killing time. And Abraham's like, why are you trying to kill it? It's holy. It's set apart. It's life-giving. Do you not know how to use time? 
And the second piece here that we mentioned is that God blessed it. However it's practiced, it is a blessing. It's supposed to be a blessing, not a burden. A gift to us, as we will see. So the first thing that the Decalogue mentions is that the Sabbath rest is patterned after how God, before the fall even, worked and rested, worked and ceased from his labors, filled his day in what's called holy and blessed. Their identity is in this. Now, there's a second passage that contains the Decalogue. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Again, it's recounting the Ten Commandments of, of God that he gave to Moses to give to the people to form them into an identity. And here there's a little bit different of a therefore, of, of why we practice Sabbath. So Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12 says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As the Lord your God commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servants and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, in view of God's work of freedom, therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So the Sabbath was practiced six days of work, one day of rest. In the Jewish mind, in the Jewish calendar, the day always begins at sundown. So Sabbath day begins Friday night at sundown. And it goes through Saturday until sundown again. The Jewish mind is always the beginning of a day begins from rest. That the eighth day after creation began from a place of rest. Their productivity begins from rest. This is their identity. And he says, you remember, you were slaves in Egypt. When you were in slaves, did you have a day off? How many days a week did you work as a slave? Seven. What was your value to that sort of economy? What was your identity in that sort of an economy? What did you root yourself in in that sort of economy? Your value, your identity was based in one thing. How many bricks did you make today? That's it. How many bricks did you produce today? Your value and identity is building bricks. And so God says, I don't want your identity to be rooted in what you can produce in this world. Even produce for another. I don't want your identity to be rooted in what you can purchase and procure even from another. And so I'm going to set up a holy rhythm of work and rest so that your identity is reminded every single week. It's not about how many bricks you made. It's not about how many bricks you sold or could buy. It's rooted in this, that God in the creation story made you in his image. He made you on the sixth day and on the seventh he rested. And in your rest, wholly set apart, you'll remember the works and the ways of God. You remember who you are and what God has done, bringing you out of a place of slavery, an economy that wants to reduce your value to how many bricks you can make to my kingdom, a blessing in my kingdom that your identity is rooted in who you are made to be. Now, do you think in the American economy it would be helpful if people were reminded on the regular that their value and worth is not based in how many bricks they made this week? How many dollars they made this week? What they were able to produce this week? even procure from others. See, in both accounts in Exodus and Deuteronomy, it's not just for the Jews. It's for all their servants, you can say employees, for all their animals, livestock, and for all their immigrants. Their rest couldn't even be built on the back of an immigrant. Like it, they, they had to rest too because they were living in God's economy. Now, this is radical. The rest of the world looked at the Jews every time they would be around and go, you guys are so foolish. It's so unproductive to stop working. They said, that's, that's because my identity is not based 
in what I produce. It's based in who I am as God's child. And I even want down to the animal that serves me and the immigrant that's visiting with me to know about my God who works and rests, for he cares about his image bearers. That's what the Sabbath is teaching. Now, we saw in the book of Nehemiah, they're breaking the Sabbath, and Nehemiah is the last historical book of the Old Testament. So as we're, we're journeying towards Jesus, they had been breaking the Sabbath, and they've been called back to the Sabbath, and now they're, they're really serious about keeping this Sabbath of, of really no work. And so what they have done is what's called a, building a fence around the law. They start adding their own personal traditions more than what Moses had commanded people to do. They add their own traditions to the law of what it means to keep a Sabbath. So they give regulations of how far can you walk on the Sabbath. What sort of work can you do on the Sabbath? If one of your animals falls into a pit, can you help that animal out? If someone needs your help down the street, can you go do that? And they built all of these traditions around the Sabbath to keep it holy, set apart. And when Jesus comes on the scene, he has to remove and address many of these man-made traditions of what they think the Sabbath to be. And so the Pharisees, the religious leaders of those days, have been upholding the traditions of the religious leaders trying to keep a fence around the Sabbath. Now, at first you're like, man, those religious leaders. But you know what they remind me of mostly are, are passionate evangelicals. And they just want to do what's right. They want to be holy. They want to follow God's ways. And so they see the temptation of people always to work on the Sabbath, to, to earn a little bit more, to be productive. And so they begin to start making rules upon rules to keep people from doing those things. So imagine if, if I say, okay, God made a rule that says you can't touch this book. Well, I really want to touch the book. Every middle school boy in this room is like, I want to touch the book, so you told me not to touch the book. <laughs> I'm with you. So well, we know that, so let's make another rule. You have to be 10 feet away from the book at all times. Because we know if you're within 10 feet, it's like... <whistles> now we know, okay, okay, even when they're within 10 feet, some will still touch the book. And so let's say you can't come into the room that has the book. Well, we know that if they're even in the building that has the book, that's going to cause some problems. So let's say you can't even go in the building that has the room, so you can't come within 10 feet of touching the book. Do you see how the fence works with good intentions? but they missed the point of Sabbath because it was a blessing and called holy. And so we see Jesus enter the scene. This is Matthew chapter 11. This is what Tyler read earlier, a familiar passage where Jesus says in chapter 11, verse 28, come to me. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you what? Rest. Like real rest? Sabbath rest can be found in Jesus. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my form, my ways upon you. And learn from me, right? Like imitate me, disciple after me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, which is really what we want. We want soul rest. Like the core of my being is at rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And those are familiar words. And oftentimes we stop there because that's the end of chapter 11. But chap chapter 12 starts, and it's not a break, really. It is in our Bible, but not in the story as Matthew wrote it. So 12 verse 1, the very next verse, you know what it's about? Sabbath. Like this is what Jesus is talking about is Sabbath. Chapter 12, verse 1, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath, because they had built a fence. And plucking grains of head was considered work. And he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. There was a time, if you remember in the Old Testament, David comes into the temple and he takes holy bread that's supposed to be set apart, sacred, and he gives it to hungry people that aren't priests. On the Sabbath, he's breaking it. Jesus says no. Verse 5, or have you read in the law how the Sabbath, or sorry, on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? He's saying, think about the priests. On the Sabbath day, they're working. 
They're leading the Sabbath, and they're not breaking the Sabbath. This is what Jesus says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, this is the whole purpose. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Like, you've taken Sabbath, which was holy blessing for people to be rooted and rested in the identity of who they are in God, and you have made it a religious, sacrificial burden for people. And I desire mercy. Like, be merciful. The whole purpose of Sabbath is to renew people, to give life back to them, let them be rested, restored for the next week ahead. In fact, when you see Jesus on the Sabbath, this is much of what he's doing. Account after account is Jesus on the Sabbath entered the synagogue to teach. That sounds like work, doesn't it? How can you teach and work and still have Sabbath? On the Sabbath, they would bring people who have injuries into the temple or the synagogue where Jesus was to see if, would he heal? And Jesus in mercy would heal the man or heal the woman. They thought that he was breaking the Sabbath. He's restoring life. Oftentimes you would find Jesus on Sabbath at a dinner party with religious leaders dining and delighting in company with food. Maybe Jesus practiced a fundamentally different Sabbath than the Pharisees could ever imagine. That all of his work on the Sabbath, it wasn't idleness. It was a work devoted to God to renew people, to restore people, to bring people back to life before the work week began again. And he says that I am the Lord. I mean, like, I own this thing. I created this thing. True Sabbath is found in Jesus Christ. However you practice Sabbath, the absence of Christ is not a true Sabbath. And so what we see in Mark chapter 2 is Jesus again on the Sabbath teaching, making this very explicit. This is Mark chapter 2, verse 27. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He says, you have taken this thing and injected so much religion into it that you have burdened the people as though this whole thing is a religious duty instead of the creation story that I made something as a gift and blessing for you. And you have made people hate the Sabbath to not want to practice the Sabbath. And I'm telling you, I made this for your good to be blessed in your life with because the world wants to reduce you to how many bricks you can make and what you can buy and root your identity in anything else besides you were made in the image of God and you are fearfully and wonderfully made and loved by the creator of the universe. And so this is why, let's go back to Paul. This is why Paul says, okay, God is bringing in Gentiles who had no practice of Sabbath. That all the days are the same to them. Now they're bringing him into the family of God with Jews who have practiced Sabbath their whole life. And he says, okay, you don't have to conform the Gentiles to this way, this practice. That's not the point. And so we go back to Romans chapter 14, where he's resolving this again. He says, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Let me ask you this. Are you fully convinced that the way you rhythm your schedule, practice or do not practice Sabbath, is patterned after the ways of Jesus? And if you're not fully convinced that the way you're rhythming your life right now is in the pattern of Jesus, then it's a worthy investigation of how to make some changes. For here are his disciples, his pupils, his followers. We want Christ fully formed in us. Again, Paul has to address this in another church in Colossae. This is Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Talking about all these divisions that are happening, how people are carried away with all these human traditions. He says, it's all about Christ. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink or in regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Don't let other people's opinions 
try to press you into what you think you should be doing. Be fully convinced in your own mind. Even when it comes to Sabbath. It says, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. That's why all true Sabbaths that are practiced without Christ as its substance are not a true Sabbath. So Sabbath is holy, means set apart from what is common or ordinary, to cease from creating, producing, even from, from buying, so that we can be devoted, not in idleness, but in attention to delight, rest, contemplate, think about the works and ways of God. What a beautiful thing to do it together as we gather in one place to think about such things, to be formed by such things. Now, I know this doesn't resolve all the, what do I do? And the questions of like, well, well, hold on a second, is Sunday the Sabbath or is Sabbath still Saturday? For the Jew, it's Friday night through Saturday until evening. What is the Sabbath? What are we supposed to be practicing? Do I need to start upping my church attendance? Well, I would encourage you to go to church. That's a good thing. But here's kind of the evolution of it in a really short synopsis. Okay, how did we get here? So if you think of historical timeline, you have Jesus entering the scene and, and Jesus is practicing Sabbath. He's going to the synagogue, he's teaching, he's, he's healing, he's doing acts of mercy and grace on the Sabbath, but he's recognizing the Sabbath. After his death and resurrection, the disciples who have been practicing Sabbath on Saturday with Jesus continue to practice Sabbath. We see in Acts that the disciples would often come into the synagogue on Sabbath day and they would do similar things. They'd be teaching, they'd be doing works of mercy and grace on the Sabbath. And then you're seeing that many Gentiles, the, the people who aren't in the Jewish family are being brought into the family of faith through Christ, and they have a different rhythm. And so Paul is speaking to that. Do we keep the Sabbath? Do we force them to become Jews, in a sense, of practicing the Sabbath? And they were called Judaizers. And Paul says, no, you don't need to do that. Don't let someone say what is honorable if if you're fully convinced in your mind that this is unto the Lord, for the Lord is the Sabbath. He's the substance of it. And so for a season, you have the followers of Christ in that first century Practicing still Sabbath, going to synagogue, teaching, acts of mercy. And then they began to gather. This is Acts 2.42. On the first day of the week, Sunday. They call it Lord's Day. And the reason they gathered on Sunday, the first day of the week, was that was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And so they would gather on Resurrection Day. Some would even call it the eighth day or the beginning of new creation. Like another first day has happened where Christ has risen from the dead and new creation, new life has begun. So let's gather on that day. And so Acts 2, 42 is they're gathering on Sunday, the Lord's Day, and they're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, and to prayer on Sunday. Now their Sunday was more like Monday. They didn't go to work. Maybe they'd gather after work on that day. Well, as time passed, they dropped much of the practice of Saturday as the church became increasingly more Gentile taking on probably some of Paul's teaching of just be fully convinced in your mind. They said, well, we're fully convinced that we should gather with the people of resurrection who recognize Christ from the dead. And that happens on Sunday. And so much time passed where they just continued to gather on Sunday exclusively. And many of the early church fathers began to treat Sabbath as metaphorical or spiritual or eschatological, meaning that it's a spiritual reality that we're not supposed to separate ourselves from just the day of work, but from all sin. True Sabbath is found in the Lord separating yourself every day from sin, from the works of the world, and devote yourself to the works of God always. This was a predominant view for many, many years. Probably it shifted in the 12th century with Thomas Aquinas. And what Aquinas did was Aquinas said, okay, looking at the Decalogue, you guys have made the fourth commandment, keeping the Sabbath, a ceremonial commandment that you think Jesus fulfilled. But instead, I believe and teach that it is part of the moral commandments that we must continue to uphold. And so we must practice Sabbath. And people said, well, when do we do it? Well, at this point, the church was firmly established as gathering on Sundays. And so through the moral teaching of Sabbath through Aquinas, They become Sabbath observers on Sunday. And Sunday now is linked with a holy day set apart to devote your time and attention and affections and delight to the things of God. Now, this is picked up later in the Reformers. The Reformers actually begin to distance themselves from the Sabbatarians. They become anti-Sabbatarian, means they don't uphold to these things. So Luther distances himself from from everything he considers to be Jewish tradition. And this is also the practice of Sabbath on Saturday. 
You also see John Calvin not practicing Sabbath as we would understand it. Though his commentary on Genesis is that God is a work-rest God and we should rhythm our life in work and rest. And many of the Puritans later picked up this idea that the Sabbath is not on the seventh, but one of seven. Meaning that it's just one of seven. That's the rhythm. And so one day a week, whatever day that is, you should rhythm that story. And those Puritans helped form Westminster Catechism in which the Sabbath becomes catechized as this is the day on Sunday and you have to cease from your work. All works. And they start building what looks like a fence. No sports. No running. Thank you, Eric Liddell. Chariots of fire. Until you have people saying, hold on a second. What did Paul say? What did Jesus say? What do they call Sabbath? They call it blessing and holy for us to be recreated almost, to be rested from our labors. Yeah, we, we cease from what is ordinary work, building, procuring, so that we change our attention and affections for God on this day. And so if you're going to build a Sabbath rhythm, and I would encourage you to do it, you build it with four things in mind. First is it's in the creation story. God is a work-rest God. Now, I know we live in a different rhythm. We don't live work six days, one day off. Some work five days, two days off. Some people work three shifts and have four days off. Some people even work two 16s. Some people are retired. And so don't try to just press your life into this rhythm. But note it's worthy that God himself knows when to cease from his creative work and rest delight in it. Do you know how to do that? Is that on repetition for you? In some capacity. The second thing to note is from the Exodus or from the Deuteronomy story in which we are reminded to cease from our labor so that we often connect our identity on the regular to who God calls us to be, not what we have made or what we have produced. So add that rhythm into your life. And however you add it, remember that Jesus is the Lord of it. So it's not just a day off, not another vacation day. It's a day in which we're devoted to Jesus. He's the Lord of it. So if he's absent from your Sabbath, it ain't a Sabbath. And then last is this. Hebrews 4 picks this up, that there's a greater Sabbath coming. That all of human history is moving for Christ's return, that he will institute a Sabbath rest from all this. And so have in your mind, as you practice Sabbath, a greater Sabbath. We should strive to enter it, that God will give to all those who belong to Jesus Christ. Now, how does my family and I practice this? This is, a, man, this is tough. This is something that Kristen and I have struggled with. Because you've got you to practice it in real life. How does a mom with, with young kids changing diapers, how does a dad with young kids feeding them in the middle of the night practice Sabbath? How does, how does a family of six practice Sabbath? For us, we have just intentionally said, we're going to incorporate what happens on Sunday because we're gathering, gathering with God's people and our attention is for the Lord into Sabbath. And so it's, it'll be rare that we are out on Saturday night. We are in our house, around the dinner table, playing games, to everything's kind of turned off on Saturday night as we're entering rest. And we wake up, and I, as Jesus came in and taught, like, I'm teaching. So we're like, well, you're working on the Sabbath. No, I'm, 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 I'm teaching on the Sabbath with the people of God, the people I love, whose hearts and minds are towards God. And then Sunday afternoon is slow, maybe at a park, playing games with the kids, taking an afternoon nap, so good. Gather again with family or friends, maybe for dinner, Maybe kids come back to, to the church to gather with their peers as their attention is on God. And then we resume our work week on Monday. That is not to be imposed on you. Just a model of what has worked for us. Here's my question. Are you fully convinced that the way you are rhythming your schedule is an honor of what God has called blessed and holy for your good? If not, there are steps to begin to take. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace in this. We thank you that you are not prescriptive, that you are not a fundamentalist. We thank you that we live under the lordship of Jesus, who is the Lord of our Sabbath. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would fully convince every man and woman in this room how they are to rhythm their lives in work and rest, in holy time set apart for devotion with God. I pray that you would form them unlike all the people of the world that are formed into a productivity 
formation. I pray that you would help us as we stumble our way through this and that you would be so kind and gentle for you are lowly of heart. Father, we want to take your yoke, your form on us for it fits so well. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.